Hello. Welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. And I'm doing a vlog. Just my lighting a bit. Better. Sorry about that. I'm doing a vlog because, well, I just saw Guardians of the Galaxy. And, honestly, I want to talk about that. So, I want to talk about it. Um, I did not see this movie in 3D, first off. I saw it in 2D. Um, I'm actually recording this the same day I saw it, because I wasn't able to see it opening weekend, because of having a cold. Also, if my voice sounds a little off, that is because, again, I have a cold. Or rather, I'm getting over a cold. Um, so, you get a brief discussion of my background with the Marvel cosmic universe in comics. Um, some of the first Marvel trade paperbacks I checked out when I was younger were stuff like, not only really the Infinity Gauntlet, but stuff like Death of Captain Marvel, stuff like, um, yeah, so, so like Death of Captain Marvel, some of the various, um, Lesser Thanos stuff, not the Infinity Gauntlet storyline itself, but other showdowns with Thanos, um, some Silver Surfer stuff, and I've read a fair chunk of the Annihilation event, uh, not the Annihilation event, yeah, the Annihilation event, um, but not the entire, but yeah, I have a, I have a passing familiarity, this is what I'm trying to say with the cosmic end of the Marvel Universe. Um, I probably know a bit more about the X-Men side of things, she are, and um, that sort of stuff. So, coming to this with a certain degree of, with a passing knowledge, enough that I know, for example, who the Collector knew who the Collector was before he showed up in the Stinger on Thor 2, and that sort of thing. Um, having, no, known, having known who Thanos was, um, you were on the accuser and who these other guys were. What did I think coming into this movie? What, what, what did I think of this movie? It was really fun. It was a really fun movie. Um, when I saw the trailers and stuff for it, I got a really strong Farscape vibe from the movie. The very sort of human whisked off to the far end of the galaxy by forces he if not forces he didn't understand or could control, but at least by aliens or something else from there. I'd kind of gotten the idea, or kind of clued in from the first trailer with the Walkmen that Peter Quill had been taken from Earth as a kid in the 80s or something like that. And I, and I was pleased to see that it actually called these things correctly. So, quick premise, quick description without getting into spoiler, spoilers of the plot. In 1988, Peter Quill, a ordinary kid, um, sees his, um, sees his mom die from cancer. Um, she's in the hospital. He's there when she dies. Um, he doesn't know who his father is, though his mom says that he was like an angel and made of light. Is the um, phrases that they use, and. He, and she gives him a parting gift, a, a gift before he, before she dies. He runs off, um, and then he is immediately like right after he runs out outside of the hospital before anyone can catch up with them. He is abducted by aliens. Cut to now. Peter Quill has now been raised by. Wrapped by a group of aliens called the Ravagers, which are basically space pirates. Um, and he goes to the ruins of this planet to retrieve a, to retrieve the film's MacGuffin, the orb. Which, if you look at the trailers and stuff, and said, oh, that's probably an infinity stone. Well, kind of duh. With, well, with the, Stinger from Thor of the Dark World, yeah, because these stones are getting important in the Marvel Universe. It's not a 
hard guess to make. Um, though our, although Peter Quill does not know that this is a Infinity Stone, he just knows it's something that somebody put it, that he's been hired to get. Um, he is interrupted by Korath, who is the enforcer, or one of the enforcers of, of Ronan the Accuser. Um, Peter Quill manages to get away kind of by the skin of his teeth and ends up being caught in Ronan's plans to take out the um, Satarians, I'm mangling the name, uh, but they're the race which runs, which operates the Nova Corps, um, inter, uh, interstellar policemen. So, um, ultimately, um, Peter Quill, a.k.a. Star-Lord, this, this opening scene is where we learn he has given himself the nickname of Star-Lord. Um, uh, Star-Lord and a group of basically misfits who he meets first on Xandar when he's taken into custody, and, and they're all taken into custody, and then on a uh, the, the space prison of the Kiln um, have to join forces to stop Ronan the Accuser from destroying Xandar, and also to deal with, well, also setting up for a, I think, just Ronan the Accuser, they kind of set up for a sequel hook that Thanos is the biggest bad out there, and so there's that there. Again, not too spoilery. Thanos is the kind of thing you save for a big Avengers movie. Uh, particularly since we were first introduced to him in an Avengers movie. This is really the kind of thing where you bring together the Marvel Cinematic Universe together. They might even possibly call it, mar call the movie, I don't know, Marvel Presents the Infinity Gauntlet. Um, anyway. So, premise out of the way, getting back to talking about the movie plot and characters and that sort of thing. Peter Quill, Star-Lord, is very much a John Crichton from Farscape kind of character. If you're familiar with Farscape, you know what that is. If you don't, John Crichton is kind of... He's not a man out of time in the way that Buck Rogers is, um, but he is a man out of place. He is a man where... The person... Basically, in terms of what it means to modern audiences, with a whole bunch of pop culture knowledge um, in his head that no one else gets or recognizes because they don't have the familiarity with pop culture, with our pop culture. Now, all this pop, all this pop culture knowledge, all these human idioms in his head and terminology, and so we get this bit of humor with him whenever he's communicating with somebody. Of these were Shaka of the wa Shaka when the walls fell variety. If you're familiar with the Next Generation episode, um, Darmok. The oh, so this thing is, um, and we're getting a real uh, Maltese Falcon Raiders of the Lost Ark vibe in this thing. For example, talking about the stone, um, which in the case of Raiders of the Lost Ark, not too far off. It's a similar thing of ancient power. Um, and it works. It's the kind of thing that could lead into self-referential humor annoyingness, but it doesn't, because it's written well. It's kind of the right way to do these things, where you, where somebody makes a reference. The reference actually is, the, the, and the, the reference isn't the joke. It's people's reaction to the reference that's the joke, and their lack of understanding of it. This is actually probably the, the best way to do the family sort of Family Guy reference humor. In Family Guy, when they do a, a reference, just making a reference is a joke. You never do. It's never the reaction to the reference to the joke. It's just the reference. Here, the confusion at the reference makes it work. Um, Similar sort of thing with Earth idioms like throat slitting to uh, indicate you're going to kill somebody or that sort of thing. Um, anyway. 
So, rest of the cast. Um, talk about Gamora and Drax are the next two and probably the easiest ones to talk about in brief. Drax is played by Dave Batista, professional wrestler, who wrestles under his last name of Batista. Um, I was expecting absolutely nothing from Batista's, possibly even less than nothing from Batista's acting performances. Not because I don't think professional wrestlers can be good actors. The Rock is an excellent actor. The Rock is an excellent wrestler. Um, I think I, one of the wrestlers I've seen acting performances of. Um, I mean, the Rock's probably the best example. Um, I haven't seen any of Chris Jericho has done some acting work. I haven't seen it. The only exposure to Edge was from Highlander, um, Endgame. But, Rock is a great actor. He has a really good sense of, he's a really charismatic person in, when he cuts promos and stuff in the ring. He's able to carry that charisma into the movie. But he is, uh, he hasn't really had the sense of charisma, a sense of power, but not really any charisma to him, which is probably the reason why he works best in wrestling in the stable. But here, he gets good material to work with, and James Gunn, the film's director, gets a really good performance out of him. Um, if you remember with Drax in the comics, his sto- backstory is very tragic. His wife and children are murdered by Thanos, the, man- the Titan, and he basically goes on this galaxy-wide quest for vengeance against Thanos to destroy him and get revenge for what was done to him. In the film, it's um, Ronan, the accuser, who's killed Drax's wife and uh, family, but it's still pulled off well. Um, as far as the, the, the story is still there, it's not changed much aside from one instigator. Um, and so, because of the tragic backstory, Batista has to do a certain degree of emoting in here, not just in terms of the anguish, not the anger, anguish, but the anger at Drax of the, my name is Enigo Montoya, you killed my wife and daughter thing. I apologize for the terrible accent. Um, but also of the, the Dilski material where he basically has to be sad and upset. And when it comes to failures in acting performances, um, I found the hardest one, or the, or the one where failure is most clearly visible, is sorrow. Um, anger is kind of easy. I mean, there's still di- there's still difficulty in acting. Acting is not the easiest thing in the world to do. And there are plenty of people who think, oh, I can act, and then, no, they can't. But when it comes to what emotions to do, um, in which motions are harder than others, I'd put sorrow as harder than anger, and maybe happiness somewhere in between, because it's kind of, depending on state of mind when you're doing the performance, even if you're of the method acting and kind of call up the, the experience in your head of when you had the emotion that you need for this performance or whatever, um, you, you still run into a certain degree of, I am happy, and it's really fake and forced. Um, but it works. Um, Batista's performance here works. Um, that said, he's not going to be taking home any Academy Award nominations for this either. And this isn't the kind of movie, his performance here isn't the kind of thing where I'm going to go, if Batista starts getting acting roles in a lot of other movies, where I'm going to go actively hunting out a movie because, oh, Dave Batista's in it, as opposed to The Rock, where if The Rock's in a movie, for a second there, if The Rock's in a movie, I will at least consider going to see it. So that. Um, Zoe Saldana as Gamora. She's alright. Um, and good performance. 
Zoe Saldana is an excellent actress, much better actor than Batista is. Her material she's given here is kind of eh. Um, it's not eh, it's, eh, it's good. Good, but not great. It's not like she's being given, you know, Robert Downey Jr. in Iron Man level performances, for example. Um, or level material. So it leads to Bradley Cooper as Rocket and Vin Diesel as Groot. I'll admit, I have not seen The Iron Giant. That's the thing I need to rectify. Uh, when people were hearing that Vin Diesel was cast as Groot, those was considered a major casting coup because The Iron Giant was a summer similar character where it's not a eloquently long-spoken um, character. Instead, it's a character with short, with not a lot of lines, but has to convey a lot of emotion through the reading of those lines. And it's a similar thing with Groot. Groot has a vocabulary, and for his English is concerned, of three words. I am Groot. Within that I am Groot, you have to mean all sorts of things. And Vin Diesel's actually commented that he wished people could see his script. Because in his script, when he has descriptions of the I am Groot line, it basically has like two columns. One column, I am Groot. Other column, here's what I am Groot means. Here's all of the emotional subtext and what's going on in Groot's head for this thing. And all of these, everything he's trying to say. And it can be from a couple, a couple paragraphs for each I am Groot. Um, and I kind of want to read that. Because Vin Diesel does a really great job of conveying different emotional states for each I am Groot. Finally, Rocket, played by Bradley Cooper. It was, it was Bradley Cooper. Rocket is also excellent. Um, I mean, it, one of the big things when the movie was announced, we, people who aren't fans of the Marvel Cin Marvel comic universe were talking about was, oh, who'd see a movie with a rack with a character named Rocket Raccoon in it? Hopefully. Those people are eating their hats, photocopies of their words, or other similar things. Because Rocket Raccoon is awesome. Bradley Cooper is an excellent... I'll double check and make sure this is actually Bradley Cooper. Otherwise, I will feel really stupid. Stupid than usual. If I misremembered the actor's name. Bradley Cooper. Yep, I was right first time. I'm not misremembering things. Yay. Bradley Cooper is great. That's Rocket. And for an all-CGI character, Rocket's probably the best all-CGI character on screen since Gulp. Rocket looks right. For a particular... Since he's a raccoon, you run into the problem of rendering hair and the hair looks great um, he emotes excellently considering that he's talking and doing human facial expression stuff which is something raccoons I presume don't do um, I admit I am not a biologist I have not spent time in the studying of raccoons and what their facial features look like in different states of mind but anyway Bradley Cooper's voice acting performance is excellent. The CGI for Rocket makes him a very expressive, fully realized character. Um, and gives him the emotional depth that's needed to make us as the audience buy into the idea of Rocket Raccoon being someone who we want to care and empathize with. Um, in a way that's actually even harder for, harder than for Groot. Yeah, Groot is a tree person who doesn't exist in the real world. So, we'll buy pretty much anything from Groot. To a certain degree. Um, we have no expectations for tree person, aside from maybe Ent. 
Rocky Raccoon, Talking Animal, we're not going to take him seriously off the bat. You have to go through the uphill struggle of how do we make people take this character seriously? How do we make people take this character and respect it and not laugh him off the screen and not and just not find the movie because, oh, hey, Talking Animal, therefore inherently stupid? It's an uphill struggle. It's something that's difficult to pull off, and they do it. Um, in fact, I'd say Rocket Raccoon is currently probably my top five, top five favorite characters in Marvel Cinematic Universe right now. Um, if you take all the all the characters who are Avenger member, the current event members of the Avengers off the list. Maybe guys with members with either members of Shield, current or former, um, he, um, he's probably higher up on the list. But Rocket works. Rocket absolutely works. Uh, so other than that movie, I meant tone. I mentioned Farscape. Farscape is a show which bounces back and forth between really serious and really silly. Um, it's kind of hard not to do that when you have characters who are on the run from the law, um, who, if they are caught by the authorities, they will all be killed, plus having other factions who are after them would also like to kill them or pick through their brains for um, information that would allow them to conquer the galaxy, or both, while at the same time having an alien who farts helium. With that in mind, and, and so Farscape has the, the, this juggling act of really serious subject matter, but also humor. And how do you get this where you, you have the humor and the seriousness fit together without the humor undermining the seriousness and without the seriousness causing tonal whiplash whenever the humor comes, and the whole tonal whiplash thing coming up. And it works. It really works. I get this real sense that um, basically the uh, James Gunn realized if the humor overwhelms this, no one will take this movie seriously. But we need to have... Uh, but this is serious stuff. We're laying the groundwork for large chunks of the Marvel Cinematic Universe after this. We're laying the chunks for groundwork to possibly, potentially, for Avengers 3. That what the events of Avengers 3 are ultimately going to be born out of the information we learned in this movie. And so we basically get the, the resolution of this is the fact that we have these bunch of all criminals who don't trust each other, who don't get along at the very beginning, who are trying to betray each other, trying to make money, um, and are all kind of smart asses and assholes being bound together by a literally existential threat. Um, and it, it, it really works. Um, this could, this, this is a movie full of all these pieces which are great in the comics, and could have utterly, utterly fallen apart um, if handled improperly. It's the same sort of juggling act that we got with the first wave of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, with the possible difference here that um, with Guardians of the Galaxy, we're putting together the team without having each member of the team get its individual movies. It's like It's not quite like going straight into the Avengers without having had... Um, the, the first wave, because the Avenger actually it kind of is like that, except um, if we in the Avengers we had to put dialogue scenes in there to explain everybody's backstory. Um, but probably the, my, the biggest weakness that Guardians of the Galaxy has is it has to tell a lot more than it shows. Um, it shows a lot. But it's but things like, for example, um, Gamora's backstory with Thanos and why she hates him, um, Drax's backstory 
with Ronin and why he hates Ronin. Um, Rocket Raccoon's backstory and why he's a talking raccoon. All of these things are um, are things which... How do I put this? You could probably get a movie out of it. Although with... Um, I don't... Probably a higher, harder sell than just Guardians of the Galaxy or the first wave of Marvel Unit uh, movies. Um, but... Because we didn't get that, we have to have this dialogue there. Because we need to know where all these characters are coming from. We need to know their... Um, we need their motivations. Um, because ultimately, because of their motivations, that's what ultimately gets us to buy into them working together. Um, well, not just binds, not just gets, them to, gets us to buy into them working together, but also why they wouldn't work together sooner. Uh, so, all said and done, I'll definitely go see the. I'll definitely get this movie that comes on DVD and Blu-ray. Um, Guardians of the Galaxy Two has already been greenlit. Peter Gunn, uh, but Peter Gunn, um, James Gunn has already said he's work, currently working on Guardians Two right now. Which presumably, which I mean, because we're talking about Disney Studios here. Disney money. That's not just surprising. This is probably the thing is where it's like, oh, um, once they finish wrapping, yeah, uh, these sets, the the interior of um, Star Lord's ship, the Milano, and also and, and some of these other ones, don't strike those. Leave it. Leave it alone. Uh. But otherwise, works great. Um, oh, one thing I need to mention: soundtrack, movie soundtrack, very heavily influenced by seventies, pop, late seventies, early eighties kind of pop, some rock stuff. Um, all works really well. This movie has probably the best use of the Pina Colada song in the history of film. Look for it, and just keep in mind that the actual title of the Pina Colada song is "Escape." That's all I'll say there. Um, other than that, the one thing I'd say is there's probably one sequence in the movie where they don't use a, a 70s piece of music, which I think it would have fit. There's a scene where it could have benefited from the use of um, Palm Sawyer by Rush. You'll know the scene when you've seen it, when you see it. But other than that, it's great. Um, I've heard that the sales of some of these songs on like iTunes and Amazon uh, Music Store have increased since the mo- since the trailers and now the movie come out. Um, so I, I be I'm not surprised by that. Um, I hope they kind of continue with some of this in the next movie, and hey, maybe we can give some other artists from the '70s or whatever who. I perhaps fallen off the chart, not just the charts, off the charts, but fallen off of popular consciousness or exposure, a little boost back up. Other than that, enjoy this movie. I'm interested to see not just how this ties into the larger Marvel Cinematic Universe, because with the part with the Infinity Stones thing, that part's already pretty clear. Same with Thanos bit, but I think what I, re- what I ultimately really want to see. I want to see how how the Guardians link up with the Avengers, and when that happens, because I think I think that meeting is going to have to have to be more than just the Affinity Gauntlet movie, just because the sheer amount of potential to come out of this meeting of character beats with Peter Quill and all the rest of the Guardians who probably don't know anything of at all about Earth. Um, Peter Quill, who's been gone for 20 years, and thus possibly getting a similar than identical culture shock to what Captain America had. Um, 
while at the same time, the Avengers crew running into these bunch of assholes, bunch of a-holes, as the uh, first trailer says. Um, I think that wraps it up. Uh, trailers, nothing new of note. Um, the the Big Hero 6 trailer is kind of, it's interesting, but kind of, eh. Um, like, uh, there's a, I got a sort of new-ish trailer for Expendables 3, in the sense that it's all footage I've seen before, but cut together in a different order, and a different piece of music. Whatever. Oh! Here's a trailer for a movie that I'm not looking forward to. Look, actually, four things. I saw this movie at 10 in the morning. This is a PG-13 rated movie, but every trailer here was for, like, a, with the exception of Expendables, was for a G-rated, P G or PG rated film. Which is really disappointing. Um, because a lot of these movies are, like, really dumb kids movies, which give away all the jokes in the trailer. New Night at the Museum movie. I watched the trailer, and I've seen pretty much every joke. Also, pee jokes. I realize kids find pee jokes, like, the majority of kids find pee jokes funny. But when I was, I admit that when I was a kid, saying this is a kid, guy who's wearing a Shadowrun t-shirt, who grew up reading science fiction novels, and probably considered himself a little higher intellectual level than most other kids, pee jokes never really cut it for me. And when you're putting the pee jokes in your trailer, that's just... No. Also, terrible... Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good... Sorry for shaking the camera there. Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. It's... That's probably the biggest disappointment to me. Is it's a kid's book I read a lot as a kid. Um... Not cut, not just because the main character's name is close to mine, uh, but the original book is a book where it kind of spoke to the idea that sometimes your day just goes to hell, and but like your day goes just to hell. And having to deal, and everyone else is doing fine, but your, your day, your personal day, went totally down the crap. And dealing with that. And this movie isn't that. It's like, it's like, Alexander, the main character, his day is normally terrible. Then this one day, everyone, all the rest of his family's day goes awful. But Alexander's isn't is apparently not so bad. Whatever. Oh, and um, there's a new Annie. Movie being made, Audition of the State, probably musical. They've changed, um, Mr. Pity Bags or Money Bags, um, name to Mr. Stacks, Stacks of Cash. And my kind of response to this is, Bags of Money are still an image that people mentally are familiar with. Why get rid of it? I don't have any problem with having um, the new band of the change of having um, Mr. Stax and Annie being now African American. That's fine. Don't mind it. Um, I even more don't mind if I actually like the fact that Annie's hairstyle is a variety of African American hairstyle which doesn't involve heavy hair treatment or anything like that, no straightening or anything like that. Having learned about this kind of stuff recently from things like The Daily Show, Peachy Keen on this point. 
Um, but I don't know. Um, I find, also find it amusing that the Annie movie is coming out when the Little Orphan Annie comic strip is no longer running. Um, that at least at least when the original Little Orphan Annie movie came out and the Broadway musicals were out, the comic strip was still running. The comic strip had been running since the Great Depression um, or before. And the fact that they're ending it now, see, that they're putting the movie out after the comic strip no longer is a thing that exists, admittedly, well, yes, the musical is still a thing that exists and performed, seems odd. Anyway. So, I, so, that's everything. That is actually everything. Next week, another episode of Nintendo Power Retrospectives. The week after, I have a graphic novel review-ish thing for you. Look forward to that. I will see you next time. <laughs>